it really bothered me to come up here and talk about this guy and knowing that I'm giving him life. Nick needs this to survive. Nick needs the limelight. Nick needs the notoriety. See, the only thing that we really doing, we giving him a transfusion. We resurrecting him. All roads led to Harlem, and all roads led to Nicky Barnes in those days. This big Kunta Kinta in Harlem, you know, this, this the Al Capone of Harlem. Yeah, you know, you see him standing up there, you know, looking like the God, our black godfather. I'm your mama, I'm your daddy, I'm that nigga in the alley. I'm your doctor, when you need, want some coke, have some weed. You know me, I'm your friend, your main boy, thick and thin. I'm your pusher man. I'm your pusher man. <laughs> Nikki Barnes was the face of heroin trafficking during that period in the 1970s. These guys could have been on a Fortune 500, <laughs> the way they dealt with things, you know. And there was something that was professional, that you could admire that was being done, obviously under the nose of a lot of policemen. This was an affront to law enforcement. This is like thumbing the nose at DEA, the Department of Justice. You want to go right up the line to the Attorney General and the President of the United States? Ain't I clean, bad machine, super cool, super mean, feeling good for the man, super fly. You're never going to have another Nicky Barnes. Those days are over. There is no loyalty. Loyalty is a dollar. There's treachery. There's not loyalty. Nicky Barnes was a coward who crossed his friends. People that really loved him and would have died and killed for him. And he shitted on him. I read Shakespeare, I read uh, Melville, I read Philip Marlowe, I read Hawthorne, Paul Tillich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And then Machiavelli, he says that there is no right or no wrong, it's he who has the biggest guns, who determines what's right and what's wrong. But to us, it meant that if you're in powder, you got to be vicious. They enforced discipline. They protected themselves by deciding on and ordering the murders of anyone they suspected of being a threat. <laughs> I remember a homicide where they threw a guy out of about four or five story building after they shot him, rolled him up into a rug. Uh, it ain't personal, it's just business. You know, I like you and all, but you fucked up. You know, so you gotta get this. And it ain't what you owe, I guess, it's how you owe. You know, you can owe a guy money and then you disappear on him. Then the next week you're driving a brand new car. That's like the ultimate insult, the saying we saw. You know, that and if you let one guy get away with that, then everybody's going to get away with that. Then you have no strength and no power. You 
learned growing up because we've seen it. We've seen how violence is used to solve problems. Maybe we learned it at home. I can remember the time. I think I was 12, maybe 13 years old. My dad was really just a giant motherfucker. We came in, I don't know, 9, 10 o'clock, whatever it is. And they had this big argument. And, you know, and he smacked them. And so I ran and, you know, tried to help my mother. And he pushed me and said, oh, I saw that you motherfucker, you. When he charged toward me, I pulled the motherfucking zip out. And he said, oh, that's not a gun. And I fired it. Bam! But the motherfucking gun blew the pieces in my hand. <laughs> you know? My mother there, she's screaming and stuff. And I ran, I jumped out the window. Bam! was kind of like a golden boy. Everybody liked him. You know, Nick, myself, and, and others. And this group was no more than just a, a bunch of guys with similar backgrounds who grew up in the same neighborhood. And uh, people that are locked out have to find some kind of innovative way to get in. Right? You give me, you tell me success is a 10-foot wall, and you give me a 5-foot ladder, now how the hell do you expect me to get up there and get mines? So they come up with innovative ways of doing it. And in the process, they become what I call sidewalk executives. When I first started hearing about Nick, we were dancing at Smalls. I had gone into the bathroom, and when I came out, Nick was coming through the door. And everybody, it just looked like, like the whole aisle just opened up when he just walked through the door. And he had on these shades, and he was just dressed impeccably. He had these big, pretty dimples, you know. And he was smiling, and when he walked past me, the first thing I remember, he just smelled so good. <laughs> Back then, that's when Small Paradise would jump in. Jazz started bringing me around that circle. So when we go down to this bar, this one I met, uh, Nick's bodyguards, Smitty and Bobby. So Smitty turns around, he's like looking at me. Now you gotta understand, I'm about 135 pounds soaking wet. These guys are three and change. So we're sitting there, so they, uh, Smitty eases up beside me. He says, what's up, little nigga? I'm like, well, what's up? So who you come to see? I'm like, you know, I was very arrogant. I'm like, well, you writing a book? So now he grabbed me around the throat, throw me on the ground. Jazz and Nick runs out of the back of the bar, like, what's going on? So I'm like, yo, get them off of me, get them off of me. So they say, yo, they come to see me. Takes me uptown and he tells me, have I ever heard of Nicky Barnes? I'm like, who, who hasn't heard of Nicky Barnes in Harlem? You know, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, who hasn't? And on the way there, he was like, you know, what do you want out of life? I'm like, I want money like everybody else. He said, what are you willing to do to get it? I'm like, anything it takes to get it. Everybody wasn't eating back in 70, 71, you know. Everybody was not eating when he came along. Everybody was eating. Everybody was riding. Everybody was wearing nice clothes. You know, I'm not trying to glorify what he did, but he was just there on time. <laughs> Businessman's persona. You know, I wanted powder. I wanted a lot of powder. That's the reputation that I had among Italians. If you got it and it's good, give it to me. He was one of the few African American drug dealers who was trusted by the Italian American mafia as someone to do business with. The users and the dealers are going where the quality is. When a user comes on the street to buy, they don't say, well, who's the meanest motherfucker out here? They say, who got the best power? Nicky Barnes got the best power. On the street. If, if, if a guy could control a wholesale level, buy it wholesale, and then get it all the way down to the street, um, because it, 
in the past it normally passed from different little groups and they all took their cut. What Barnes did was he, he eliminated that. He bought it wholesale from the Italians and he distributed it right down to the street. And there was huge money. This is a New York quarter. When I left the street, if you heard someone was scrambling, that's what they were selling. What made this particular quarter so famous and was that my quarters, you could dump that quarter out, go get a quarter of cut, a quarter of nanite or manita, take that quarter of manita and put it with my quarter, blend them together, and they would have two quarters. And that's what the innovation was. I was there. I used to be a drug addict. You know, I used to do this. I used to be the guy down on the bottom. I used to get these things. And when I got them, I always wanted to be able to take it home and use some and mix it and then take the rest out in the streets. And that's why I did it like that. And it worked. I lived on 115th Street and 8th Avenue which is where I eventually started selling narcotic. This guy used to come to me, I don't remember his name, and the guy came to me and told me he wanted me to keep these little brown paper bags. They were caps of heroin. I didn't know it at the time. I was making good money with him. He was actually a pretty good student and had pretty good comments from teachers as a youngster. He went into the drug business because he saw, he saw the role models around him, the Bumpy Johnsons and other famous or infamous drug dealers from Harlem. Those are the fellows who were who were cool, who who had the cars and the wealth and the power. In this crazy town. We're talking about that point in time when Harlem is essentially falling apart. Harlem during the period when the, the whites and middle class have completely moved out to the suburbs and all they left behind were people who couldn't get out. There's no love to be found. I started using it when I was about 14 years old. I, mean, I was a drug addict shooting it every day, several times a day. It's a sensation, it's kind of a mystical, uplifting feeling. Kind of, kind of levitating. And these little bells go off. Ding. A lot of people feel it. Mickey Barnes, he was in prison. He ended up meeting in the weight pile. He had a book he was reading one day, and I asked him what the book was, and uh, he showed me the book. It was The Prince by Machiavelli. And uh, he gave the book to me to read, and I read it. And uh, Machiavelli, very devious character. Uh, I think most of our politicians today have read him also. Anyhow, uh, we developed a relationship as a result of that. I didn't know anything about drugs before I went in, you know, or the trade, anything. You know, I really actually learned that while I was in. And you often hear them referred to as crime schools in the past. Well, that's exactly what they are. This thing formulated in prison. It was like a, a cold conglomerate of criminal masterminds, I would say. There were times when I was talking with either, either Maggie Madonna or times when I was talking with Joey Gallo. And we talked about organizing people to be more concerned about money and less concerned about violence. When he was away, he had hooked up with the mob, you know, I mean, with the big Italians, you know. Um, and that kind of, it did, it guaranteed that he was going to have a lot of drugs and that they were going to be good. What kept me from going back to using drugs was the fact that I knew I couldn't really make money if I was a user. I wanted to make money out of drugs, and I wanted to make a lot of money. And I said, shit, 
I get out this motherfucker, man. I'm not gonna use no drugs. I'm just gonna sell it. It's just ready for him to come home. First of all, there was a lot of people that were going to get some jobs. And everybody's going to make money. Every place he went, people just wanted to be around him, wanted to look at him. I mean, he was a true superstar. Barnes was praying own people. He was addicting the very people that he was trying to be a role model to. <laughs> this shit was going everywhere. So I just told him, I said, look, the powder is supposed to sell itself. you got to have powder that people will stand in line to get it. I want enough shit out on the street. I want the street to be saturated. So whenever a buyer comes, our product is going to be out on the street. You know, I remember on 127th, you know, uh, St. Nick's around that area. You know, um, the bags that were cop there, it was regular, it was consistent. When you inject heroin, you feel no pain. And all is well with the world. That's at first. <laughs> You know, and then at some point, it gets to be not to get sick. And you would do whatever you needed to do not to get sick. We don't have any poppy fields, you know, that I know of in Brooklyn. And then we forget that someone else is pulling the strings, man, and calling the shots. I've been asked whether or not I, as a dealer, was being a tool of white man. That's probably a question that I just that I just can't answer. Through the 70s, Vicky Barnes always had a case, or two, or three. <laughs> The first major trial that we had was the bribery case. Uh, he was acquitted. The jury said not guilty. And I, uh, he looked at me after the jury verdict was read and said not guilty. And there was this look of incredulity on his face. And he said, uh, would you believe this? And I said, I do. You know, I think I did a hell of a job. Everybody got into cars, and we headed up to 125th Street. There was a place called the Purple Manor. All of a sudden, uh, he said, we're going to have a celebration. He took a bottle of champagne and broke it open and said, we're going to make, we're going to make David a, an honorary nigga tonight. A drunk came up to me and said, you, you, uh, you got $2? You know, and Nick looked at Smitty, this 408-pound uh, gargantuan young man, and Smitty took him. He grabbed him by the butt and by the back of the neck, and he drove him into the ground like he was a spike. He said, that's Mighty Whitey, man. Are you crazy? You can't bother Mighty White. And uh, 
that was uh, that was how I became an honorary nigger. When you're in state trial, your attorney has full latitude to kind of cross-examine, or they call it voir dire, examine the jurors. I remember one time, there was a case in the Bronx, and this guy, he was on the jury, and um, he was staring at me. So Dave zeroed right on in on him. What would you say if I told you that my client, as he sits here, is absolutely innocent? The juror said, well, if he was innocent, why is he sitting there? So they managed to get him off of the jury. I became a little arrogant now because after the jury came back in the murder case, he was acquitted. Um, I said, uh, what are you going to do this year? Last year, you made me an honorary nigger. He says, this year, we're making you an honorary black man. So I said, what's the big deal? I was made an honorary nigger last year. He said, Dave, we don't hang out with niggas. What? I think that's when that initial Mr. Untouchable name attached, and it just traveled along with me as part of the baggage I had to carry. It was not like I came over like some lone gunman you see in the, in the white movies, the guy come and take over the whole town. You know, one guy. <laughs> one guy just kills everybody and takes over the whole, takes all the cattle and takes all the everything, you know what I'm saying? Takes all the fine bitches and he's always in the bar giving everybody a drink and, and you know, just shooting all those. You know? It's not like that, did, that didn't happen. I just saw things develop and that kind of go up, coincided with the ideas that I had in my head. You know, you know with 100 pounds of stuff, you got to put it in somebody's hands. You can't, you can't do it yourself. Brothers going to work it out. Council was this group of people who uh, sat around with Barnes and they formed policy, like all councils would. One of the things that I, I think when you think of a business or you think of, uh, of the council is you're thinking of a certain structure. It's like there's a, a, a CEO and a president and a CFO and a COO. What takes place in the underground economy is the same thing. It just mirrors what's taking place above ground, you know, it's just like business. There were seven members in the council. There's Frank. There's Ishmael. There's Gaps. There's Wally. There's Jazz. There's Guy and myself. Guy was the pretty boy. He was the pretty boy. He was the guy that knew all the girls. Uh, Frank, he was the bully. You know, Frank was the bully. Brother and Jazz were like similar. They both like philosophers. You know, they used to read a lot and they used to teach a lot. And everywhere we went, it was like we were known. You know, I mean, we didn't have to pay for nothing. Everybody wanted to be in our circle. Just their mere presence struck fear in a lot of people. That's Frank to me. Yeah, look at Frank. <laughs> look at that smile on his face. That's how it was. That's how we were together, man. We were getting money and clicking on all cylinders. Frank used to always say, he used to always say, how soon we forget. That was a favorite saying of his. Yeah, how soon we forget. Hey, this is jazz over here. Jazz's strength was that he was basically a good stand-up brother, you know. And if we had to put on a ski mask and do something to get from point A to point B, he'd be down with it. This Scrap right here. Scrap was a part of, uh, of, of Jazz's crew, but very reliable. Scrap would go in hell wearing dynamite drawers for Jazz. Okay, this guy. He was a youngster. He was really enthusiastic about making money. And, and I liked everything about the way that he managed things. The guy saw me as a father image. This was my family, and I was and I was a dad. 
I remember one night I was going to meet Jazz at this bar and I ran a light. So the cops pulled me over and they harassed me. And I'm sitting there and he's like asking me for my license registration and Smitty said, what are you doing? I said, he wants my ID. He said, man, fuck him, park the car, go on the bar. So I'm like, you serious? He said, what'd I say? Go on the bar, people waiting for you. You, get the fuck out of here. And the cop got in his car and left. I said, that's fucking power. That's, this is the shit I'm a part of. I felt invincible. The Oath of Brotherhood was seven words for each of the seven members of the council. Treat my brother as I treat myself. And there was a certain mystical dynamic present when we said it. Because we would bind hands together and we would utter these words. treat my brother as I treat myself is in, is in the Quran. There were some who criticized us for calling ourselves Muslim. We can take from it those elements which expand us as human beings and unify us as a group the same way the Italians do with the Bible. So, you know, what's the big deal? The first thing that always stands out in my mind is that they were men. They were men in every sense of the word. And they were constantly challenging themselves and wanted to travel and learn and see the world. It was not just 110 to 150 Fifth Street. That was a very small part of who they were. They always had this thirst for knowing more and doing more and being seen as more. These were the same guys that, that, along with others, made it possible for Harlem Week. These guys cared about Harlem, man. They cared about the people in Harlem. It's all right to make money in the community as long as you give something back. At certain times of the year, Easter, Christmas, New Year, Thanksgiving, the people would come in and say, I need help. And then you left with a turkey. He had that benevolence to him, the Thanksgiving Day turkeys, the spending money. He was giving something back to the community that he was raping and, and abusing and killing. My end, my whole focus was the money. You know, as harsh as that sounds, I mean, this guy wanted to destroy his life getting high, what I care, I'm not trying to run for sainthood, I'm trying to get paid. I, mean, I had this one guy who was like my sampler, Claw, down on 116th Street. I mean, this guy's arm, do you know he didn't die till they took his arm off? I mean, his body really lived off the poison. As soon as they talked him in the hospital, I mean, if Claw got a hit, you had a bomb. Because he didn't have no place to put it. So if he felt your product, you said, oh man, you got a winner. If it was garbage, he, would, he wouldn't even, I'd pull the car, be like, yo, just keep going. Cause I need to get high and that shit you got is garbage. My life, my life, my life. Ah. I think we brought to the business of a particular type of, of expertise. Because I was a former drug addict, Frank James a former drug addict, Thomas Foreman, a former drug addict, Joseph Hayden, former drug addict. If you ain't got customers, you ain't got a business, straight up. You don't. And the customers are the ones who drive the business, you know. Um, the old timers knew that. We say old timers now, but really, the guys who had the game at the time took care of the customers. That Nicky Barnes was a dope fiend at one point. That's why he had a whole different way in which he'd done his business, straight up. I mean, you were, you were buying their product, and the customers meant money. You know, cussies meant dollars. My life, my life, my life. I think people, when they hear about a Nicky Barnes, they might have a vision of a guy that picks up narcotics himself and cuts it and it hangs around playground selling dope to, you know, to school kids. My operation had reached the level of sophistication wherein all I did was meet my supplier. My principal supplier was Matty Madonna. He was Italian. 
um, I would meet him, we would sit down, and we would, he would tell me what it was he had available for me. I would provide him with an automobile. The narcotics would be placed in the automobile. They would be dropped at a pre-designated location. They would be picked up by whoever I assigned to pick it up. And then uh, the business would function like a well-oiled machine. You know, there was girls on the table, you know, just people that did that as a living. But they used to steal. I said, just make them come in naked with no clothes on. He said, that's what I'll do. You know what we're going to do? And them bitches come up there, take motherfucking clothes off. Make them bitches strip. If they don't want to strip, fuck them. We won't hire them. And that's how it started. We used to come out like 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, we was finished. And I would do it like 1,500 to 2,000 quarters a day. I was making... I say ten thousand, between ten thousand and fifteen thousand dollars a day. Need some money. I need some money. Mm. I need some money. Head is dead. Money. In my mind, money. money was so important and so valuable that this was the this was the pinnacle against which we measured everything. That's what the American dream is all about. Getting money and getting things. You have to have 10 or 15 stacks of $1,000 in the house at all times, you know, to be and just to be comfortable. I think he modeled the council after his experiences with the mafia. He had learned a lot from the mafia and he had taken it, he had been a good student where now the student was in some ways better than the teachers. Uh, now he was making, you know, just boatloads more money than they could dream of. Black racket money stays in Harlem. No more mafia, police, mayors, senators, judges, or presidents. It's our money up here. Let's keep it. There was conflict between me and, uh, and Carmine Galenti. He was saying that I was getting too big for my riches. I think Carmine thought that East and West Harlem were provinces of the Italians and that and for black guys trying to move out on their own, they were kind of confronting their colonial powers. I was like the first. I was the first black dude to tell a white boy, look, you motherfuckers can't come over here fucking around. Collect the money from just dude over here because he owes the money. You got to see me. Because nine million need to make everybody the same motherfucking size. The demographics of the business has changed, and you have to recognize that. Because now I'm here, and now we're here, and this is our neighborhood. Love and happiness. Something that can make you do wrong, make you do right. Yeah. No. Those were good days. I think probably just we just had really great chemistry between us. And she liked to spend money. She is. Enjoyed shopping, enjoyed jewelry, and you know, like we used to always say, she had a black belt in shopping. You know, if I saw a pair of shoes, I'd just get every color that they had, and um, I'd have like, I don't know, a box of money, maybe with two, three million dollars in a box of money. And the only thing he would tell me was just write a note. If you take out ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, just write a note, because that way when I give this money up. <laughs> 
<laughs> to my connects, the money won't be short. They don't think I'm trying to, you know, short them out of fifty thousand dollars that you done took out of this box, you know. So, um, you know, so the life, the life was good, you know. And so you just get kind of sunk, you know, pulled right into it. His wife loved me. I mean, she was my idol. She was trying to teach me how to be a lady. You know, that one used to always kill me with that. I'm gonna teach you how to be a lady yet. You know, okay, whatever. I think one time Thelma took me to Henry Blundell to get my hair done and get a massage and pedicure and manicure. I mean, I wasn't used to that. We had our first child, we had a little girl, and he was just ecstatic. He was ecstatic. He was just like really, he just made me always feel like a little girl. I don't think I could give you a um, conventional analysis of, of what love is. You know, I was a thug, I was in the thug life, and I wanted thug love. And thug love is composed of different elements. It's composed of that willingness to hold if your man is carrying. It's saying, hey, I want to be a part of this, and I know that this is a part of you, and hey, I'm open to making my contribution. One day we were driving to, um, to New Jersey, and he took me to this house, and I was like, God, that's a beautiful house, and he said, that's your house, and I was like almost passed out. <laughs> I remember sometime he used to come in and because I was a dancer, he used to always want to learn how to do the hustle, right? And I remember sometimes he'd come in late and my daughter, when she was had gotten a little older, she would hear him come in and she'd get up and she'd jump on the sofa and she'd say, you're going to dance tonight. I probably was kind of uh, recklessly self-indulgent. Anything that I wanted, I, I tried to have it. Women, uh, that was one of my excesses with women. Um, there was something about pure cocaine and young women that held an inevitable attraction for me. And all of them were at least half my age. Oh, Shemetta. Shemetta was my favorite girl. Her body was gorgeous. Just, you know, big hips, tiny waistline, big behind, nice breasts, good looking face. A really gorgeous thing. I introduced her to Nick. She was gorgeous. I remember we had a party in Jagazi's, and she came. She's in all white. Nick asked me, oh, who's that? I said, oh, that's my friend. So I introduced her. The next thing I know, they do what they do. You know, she got a new Mercedes. Oh, wow. It's hard to describe Shemekka. She was pretty. She knew she was pretty. After she found out how Nick felt about her, she became a hot mess. You could automatically see from the very beginning that it was going to be different with Sean Mecca, that he felt something for her and that she, she meant something to him. And uh, Thelma sort of fell out of the picture. You know, I had two children, so my life was kind of consumed, you know, with, with home at that point. He started smoking angel dust, you know. So he, at that point, he started changing. I got really, really heavy, or heavy into that goddamn dust. They used to mix dust and all that shit together. Is that, 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 that whole combination would, it would, I mean, it would, it would prolong the orgasm, man, which was, that's something, man. Now, I mean, not only are you having the orgasm, but it's kind of done in slow motion. Sometimes when I was off with Becca, we would both be high off of that shit, and we would, and we would come together. Boy, that's a motherfucker, man. You know, all the girls, they, 
always was glamorous. And I used to say, oh man, it's good to be the king. And he used to say, no, it's not. You don't want to be the king. He said, oh, he said, if you, he said, you could be a prince among thieves and be a, you don't want to ever be a king because the king is the first one that goes. Uneasy is the head who wears the crown. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. We put a little bit of a fright into some of the uh, drug dealers. Sometimes they felt bad things would happen when we were around. I know the history of drug policy. You know, it was racist from the very beginning. It is racist to the core. Just see who's locked up. Listen to me. There was just so much going on in the city, so much right, right out in the open that, that, that made it unsafe to go into certain areas. It was prostitution, it was robberies, it was burglaries, it was armed confrontations. There's doors getting kicked in, there's fighting, there's shooting. And the, the fuel that was going into that tank of, of, of criminal acts was the money from heroin. I think New York City had about 2,000 homicides a year. You'd have turf wars, and you had people killed all the time. Listen to me. Whoa. It ain't nothing but a heartbreak. Well, something had to be done, and community leaders and um, politicians didn't want to see uh, you know, whole generations of their youth uh, destroyed by narcotics and be destroyed by the likes of Nicky Barnes. They wanted me to be the first person that they arrested under this Rockefeller law because they had the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration and, and the narcotics bulls were just all over me, man. want to get the rats you got to get into the sewer says so in any cases you get a bit of luck and so the luck factor in the Barnes case um, was that the FBI would turn us on to Bob Geronimo and uh, he proved to be the person that could get us on the inside cars are very important in, in the ghetto I knew guys that had Mercedes Benz's new Cadillacs New, new Buicks, new whatever, and they went home and they lived in the projects, but they had that car. And this kid in the neighborhood, Wally Fisher, who I knew to be a car thief, and he saw me buying new cars, and a couple of weeks go by, I come out of the house one day, and my Corvette's gone. Wally could have took seven grand from me, cash, it would not affect me as if he took my car. When he took my car, that was personal. The way I looked at it, Wally fucked me first. I was gonna fuck him back, bottom line. And I was gonna do anything in my power to accomplish that. Ronald McDunkel was a mob guy, he was a made guy from Pleasant Avenue, and he ran with black guys as a kid. And he ran with this guy, Wally Fisher, as a kid. Fisher was the brother of Guy Fisher, who was Nicky's main lieutenant. So he said, well, you know what? I know this guy, Nicky Barnes. You might be interested in him. Robert Geronimo had a code name. With a name like Geronimo, why do you need a code name? Welcome Back, Cotter was a show that was on television at the time. And there was a sort of slick street guy, white guy, named Barbarino. And that was Geronimo's cold name. Eventually, I get introduced to uh, Geronimo, and I basically laid it down to G. I says, G, let me tell you something. This is a partnership. This is a brotherhood, OK? And there's sometimes they wouldn't have to do things. We're going to have to do some left-handed things that only you and I are going to know. That's the only way we're going to get over. But I tell you what, one thing. This is a fucking bond. This is a brotherhood. You fuck me, I'll fuck you twice.
First and foremost, I didn't consider myself white, okay? When I say white, my skin tone is white, but I talk black, I act black, I'm from that. So to me, being around these people were nothing new. So it was not some white guy getting off a bus and saying, hey, I'm here and sell me drugs. When I brought Louie on the scene, it was so obvious we couldn't be cops and we probably weren't hitmen from the mob because it was just too obvious. It was, it was so obvious, it was believable. And Wally up to this juncture was basically uh, fetch a stepper, if you will, for the Bonds organization. You know, it was like a guy being on a team, you know, being on, sitting on a bench. You know, you're a player, you want to play ball, you know. Come on, coach, put me in a fucking game, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's what Wally felt like, you know. He felt like he was being stepped on. He wanted to be somebody. He wanted to have respect. And this is one way he could get it. The two wise guys. Wally was the weak link. And we were going to attack the weak link. We weren't there for Wally Fisher. I wasn't there for Guy Fisher. I was there for Nicky Bond. My rule was that we don't talk about drugs in the car, on the phone, or in the house, or anywhere where it could be overheard. If we get together as a group, if we want to sit down and talk about something, turn on the blender, and we'd be talking like a motherfucker about drugs. There were times when the DEA was behind me. Of course, they'd trade on me regularly, but I would lose them motherfuckers, man. There were certain routes that I knew 